Well, at this time, our text for our sermon this morning, once again, is found in the book of Acts, and we are now in Acts chapter 25. Acts chapter 25. And uh, if you're following along in the Pew Bible, you should be able to find that on page 1084. Once again, we come to another trial, another accounting of Paul and the charges against him. And it may seem like we're repeating so many things over and over, but we're reminded that Luke records all of this for a purpose. And every time he repeats himself, we must ask the question, why does he recount this and what details does he add for us? And so uh, this morning, we come to chapter 25, and what comes out of the text is the injustice that Paul faced uh, even under a new governor. I want to read the last verse of, first, or of, of chapter 24, uh, verse 27, and then we're going to read chapter 25 in its entirety. And let us be reminded this is the living Word of God, and let's receive it as such. When two years had passed, Felix was succeeded by Porcius Festus. But because Felix wanted to grant a favor to the Jews, he left Paul in prison. Three years after arriving in the province, Festus went up from Caesarea to Jerusalem, where the chief priests and the Jewish leaders appeared before him and presented the charges against Paul. They urgently requested Festus, as a favor to them, to have Paul transferred to Jerusalem, for they were preparing an ambush to kill him along the way. Festus answered, Paul is being held at Caesarea, and I myself am going there soon. Let some of your leaders come with me and press charges against the man there, if he has done anything wrong. After spending eight or ten days with them, he went down to Caesarea, and the next day he convened the court and ordered that Paul be brought before him. When Paul appeared, the Jews who had come down from Jerusalem stood around him, bringing many serious, serious charges against him, which they could not prove. Then Paul made his defense. I have done nothing wrong against the law of the Jews or against the temple or against Caesar. Festus, wishing to do the Jews a favor, said to Paul, Are you willing to go up to Jerusalem and stand trial before me there on these charges? Paul answered, I am now standing before Caesar's court where I ought to be tried. I have not done any wrong to the Jews, as you yourself know very well. If, however, I am guilty of doing anything deserving death, I do not refuse to die. But if the charges brought against me by these Jews are not true, no one has the right to hand me over to them. I appeal to Caesar. After Festus had conferred with his counsel, he declared, You have appealed to Caesar, to Caesar you will go. A few days later, King Agrippa and Bernice arrived, from Caesarea, arrived at Caesarea to pay their respect to Festus. Since they were spending many days there, Festus discussed Paul's case with the king. He said, there is a man here whom Felix left as prisoner. When I went to Jerusalem, the chief priests and elders of the Jews brought charges against him and asked that he be condemned. I told them that it is not the Roman custom to hand over any man before he has faced his accusers, and has had an opportunity to defend himself against their charges. When they came here with me, I did not delay the case, but convened the court the next day and ordered the man to be brought in. When his accusers got up to speak, they did not charge him with any of the crimes I had expected. Instead, they had some points of dispute with him about their own religion and about a dead man named Jesus, whom Paul claimed was alive. I was at a loss of how to investigate such matters, so I asked if he would be willing to go to Jerusalem and stand trial there on these charges. When Paul made his appeal to be held over for the emperor's decision, I ordered him held until I could send him to Caesar. Then Agrippa said to Festus, I would like to hear this man myself. He replied, Tomorrow you will hear him. The next day Agrippa and Bernice came with great pomp and entered the audience room with the high-ranking officers and the leading men of the city. At the command of Festus, Paul was brought in. Festus said, King Agrippa and all who are present with us, you see this man 
The whole Jewish community has petitioned me about him in Jerusalem and here in Caesarea, shouting that he ought not to live any longer. I found he had done nothing deserving of death, but because he made his appeal to the emperor, I decided to send him to Rome. But I have nothing definite to write to his majesty about him. Therefore, I have brought him before all of you, and especially before you, King Agrippa, so that as a result of this investigation, I may have something to write. For I think it is unreasonable to send a prisoner without specifying the charges against him. And there as well, we'll end this morning. Well, let us pray now for the Holy Spirit to bless our understanding of this passage. Let's pray. Our great God and our Heavenly Father, we come here this morning because we know that this is your word, and your word is truth, and your word is life. Father, we ask now that you would cause this living word to dwell in our hearts. Father, we ask now that as we come here, that you would send your spirit, open up this passage that we would see it, that we would believe. Father, we pray, give us ears to hear and hearts to understand. And so be with us now, we pray. Bless us to that end, and we ask this in Christ's name alone. Amen. Well, when we have little kids and they learn to talk, there's generally a few words that our kids learn first, at least to the best of my understanding. Words such as daddy and mommy are usually the words that that they first learn, and, and at least my kids, ball came kind of third. And they said a few of these words, but it wasn't too long in the progression, maybe in the top 10 words, it seems at least, that our kids learn, they begin to say this, that's not fair. It doesn't take them long to progress from daddy to mommy to hearing in the basement as they're playing with their siblings, that's not fair. Now there's a number of reasons for this. On the one hand, they, like us, feel we need to defend ourselves, and so we are quick to judge and quick to pronounce things that are not fair in our own eyes. That's true. But I think there's also a sense in which our children are experiencing, even from a young age, the reality that we live in a sin-cursed, broken world that is filled with unfairness and injustice all around. In fact, even as we come here this morning, we come knowing that in the past week there have been great injustices done, maybe in your own life, and even small injustices. Maybe the small things you shrug off all the way to the big things that, that cause us great consternation, we admit, that in this world, it is filled with injustice. There are many unfair things that happen, whether it's with our job, our health, in legal ways, there are many wrongs not accounted for in this life. Well, this morning, we come to a passage where Paul could say with our children, that's not fair. Paul, in our passage this morning, from beginning to end, experiences many injustices, many levels of unfairness, and in fact, one of the things that stood out to me as I studied the text this week is that Luke repeats himself over and over till by the time you're done with the text, you want to scream, that's not fair. Paul has been said at least three times by Festus in the text, there's no reason for him to be here, and yet, Paul remains in prison. Paul is facing injustice after injustice. In fact, just consider what we've seen the last couple of weeks in the text. The Jewish mob assaulted him and almost beat him to death without repercussion. He was the one who went to jail that day. They went to their families. The Jewish leader slandered him and charged him falsely, and yet while Paul was locked away in prison, they went free and continued to slander against him. By the time we come to the text, Paul has faced numerous injustices, and there are more in the text for him to endure. So what's the point? The point is, is that Paul, and through this, we learn that through the gospel, we face injustices, and we learn this morning how we are to handle those injustices. Now, the context, as we've been noting, of course, is Paul making his way to Rome, and that's one of the lessons we need to learn today. Because not only do we face injustice, but the other application is is that God uses injustice. It is interesting that Christ was already telling Paul, you're going to stand before kings and rulers, you're going to stand in Rome, and it's through injustice that Paul will make it there. Here's the theme uh, we need to learn this morning. We simply learn that God is able to use injustice in this world to advance his plan. And already there, the application comes out. That is how we can live at peace even if we face injustice. God is able to use injustice in this world to advance his plan. 
Now, the three points is simply just the three stages in the text. First of all, and this is our bigger point we're going to spend more time on, we need to note injustice extended. How Paul spent over two years now, and by the end of that two years, it's extended even more. We need to note why that happens. Secondly, we need to note injustice explained. As Festus explains to Agrippa what he does and basically excuses his unjust actions. And then thirdly, and this is a big word, injustice exacerbated. I couldn't find a better word, but that word hit the, the point right on the head, so I stuck with it. But injustice exacerbated as these people come with pomp and circumstance, all while flaunting their authority while doing injustice to Paul. And so we'll look at those three things this morning. First of all then, notice with me injustice extended. And we see that right out of the gate in verse 27 of chapter 24. We read, when two years had passed, Felix was succeeded by Porcius Festus, but because Felix wanted to grant a favor to the Jews, he left Paul in prison. Now we pass over that verse and we keep reading, but let us pause for a moment and think about that. That is two years of Paul's life. We ended last week by noting that Felix was an immoral man. Paul preached the gospel. He was afraid because Paul showed him his guilt and his misery, and yet he continued to meet with Paul, and we noted that it was because he was hoping for a bride. But now two years have passed, and Paul's still locked away in Caesarea. Why? Because this man wanted to do the Jews a favor. He knew plenty well that Paul was innocent. He knew plenty well that Roman law required him to release Paul, but two years he kept Paul because he was doing a favor to the Jews. For two whole years, Paul stood uh, in prison waiting. Now, likely he ministered. It's very possible that people would come and visit. We noted that he was given those freedoms. Many scholars actually believe that in this two-year period, is when Luke actually compiled much of the information and the interviews that makes up the book of Acts. And so, very likely, those two years were very profitable, though we're not told exactly how Paul used them. But just for our own understanding this morning, think about the last two years of your own life. Two years from now would be February 2019. Think about all that's happened in your life. Think about just last year alone, all the events. For two years, Paul didn't experience anything but a prison cell. This is injustice as Paul waits for the ruling. Now, notice how the justice is extended with Festus. Notice his arrival, verse 1 through 3. There were told three days after arriving in the province, Festus went up from Caesarea to Jerusalem, where the chief priests and the Jewish leaders appeared before him and presented the charges against Paul. Now, listen to verse 3. They urgently requested Festus as a favor to them to have Paul transferred to Jerusalem where they were preparing an ambush to kill him along the way. Luke records now that there's a new governor. The the last one was horrible. And so the Caesar intentionally chose this Festus because he was a much more just and a much more disciplined governor. In fact, actually, you see right from the text, he's ambitious. He's only been there three days and he wants right after cleaning up the mess that was left for him, and so he made his way to Jerusalem. Within three days' time, he wants to introduce himself to the Jewish leaders and begin cleaning up Felix's mess. But notice what the Jews have on their mind. It has been two years, and yet the first thing they can think of is Paul. First thing they want is Paul and his head on a platter, and so at the first moment, they bring Paul up. Now notice, for two years... They have seethed in hatred, and so much so, now notice, the leaders themselves have a plan to assassinate Paul. They realize that he's escaped their grasp over and over, so they come up with a plan. We're going to convince this new governor to do us a favor, just have Paul brought in. Listen, we're not going to do anything to him. We want justice, we want fairness, bring him in. But of course, along the way, this is their plan. They're going to try to assassinate Paul. They have a plan to eliminate Paul on his way. Now, for whatever reason, Festus did not give in. We're not told whether he understood the plot or knew of it, but instead called for them to go up to Caesarea. And I think you need to understand this point. In God's providence, once again, uh, Paul's life has been cared for. Once again, Paul's life was hanging in the balance, and God protected him. Uh, Notice the injustice extended in Festus's court. Look at verse 6 and 7. 
After spending eight or ten days with them, he went down to Caesarea, and the next day he convened the court and ordered that Paul be brought before him. When Paul appeared, the Jews who had come down from Jerusalem stood around him, bringing many serious charges against him. Now notice this word, which they could not prove. And so there it is. After Festus made his way back, he calls for Paul to be brought. All these Jews have come. Now notice a couple things about the scene. One, the Jewish leaders assemble around Paul. By this description here, it implies that a large number have come and they are surrounding Paul. And so the scene is filled by one man in the midst of a crowd and all of them with anger are pointing the finger at Paul, claiming all of these things. And notice they bring many serious charges. We're not told what those charges were. Very likely many of the same things we saw last week. But they are calling for Paul to be killed because of these charges. But notice the third thing. With none of those charges like last time could they prove anything. They have no witnesses. They have no evidence. They have baseless claims. And yet they shout them in the midst of this large crowd, hoping now that the governor will go their way. And verse 8, all we see here is simply Paul defends his case. Paul says, listen, I've done nothing against the Jews. I've done nothing against the temple. And listen, Felix, or Festus, I've done nothing against Caesar. Paul is basically doing the same thing two years later, saying there are no witnesses, there are no evidence that can convict me. And you know very well that there's no reason, based on Roman law, uh, that you should condemn me to die. Now, this is where the injustice happens. If Festus were righteous, Paul would go free that very day. But notice verse 9. It says, Festus, wishing to do the Jews a favor, said to Paul, Are you willing to go up to Jerusalem and stand trial before me there on these charges? Now notice that. Paul should go free. And Festus knew this, and yet he wants to do a favor to the Jews. Why? Uh, Very likely, he's trying to bring a good relationship. Felix had left left it a mess. The Jews were rioting against the Romans by this point. He was sent in by Caesar to, to quell this and to calm the crowd. And so he now is trying to walk a thin line. On the one hand, you know, Paul should go free. On the one hand, he realizes there's, there's no charges that he can bring that can convict Paul. But on the other hand, if he lets Paul go, he thinks that the Jews are going to riot again, and he's just going to stir the pot. So what's a man to do? Well, instead of being just, he now wants the Jews to do the Jews a favor. He asked Paul, are you willing to be tried down there? Now think about that for a moment. Paul is standing before him at that moment in Caesarea. What difference will it make if they go through the same charges again in Jerusalem? It's just, it's just a change of venue. But Paul knows very well as what is going to happen. If they do that, he will be killed along the way. So notice what Paul does. He invokes his Roman rights to preserve his life. Look at verse 10. Paul answered, I am now standing before Caesar's court where I ought to be tried. I have done nothing, or I have not done any wrong to the Jews, as you yourself know very well. If I am, however, am guilty of doing anything deserving death, I do not refuse to die. But if the charges brought against me by these Jews are not true, no one has the right to hand me over to them. I appeal to Caesar. And there it is. Paul is acknowledging right in front of Festus, you know very well this is unjust. You know very well that what you're about to do if you bring me down to Jerusalem is guilty of breaking Roman law. And in fact, Festus knew that. By his inaction, he was breaking Roman law. And so Paul then invokes the Roman right of going before the Caesar. Now interestingly, in the early days of Rome, this is one of the first rules, the first laws brought up is that if a Roman citizen was convicted of a capital offense and he felt that he was not being justly treated, he could invoke the right to be judged by the Caesar. However, to make that requirement, it had to be extenuating circumstances. And Paul invokes that, and the the next verse notes here, that Festus confers with the council and then simply approves Paul's request. But now the question needs to be asked, what is the point this morning? Again, why the repetition? Why do we need to see all these details? I think here's the point. Luke wants us to see blow by blow just how unjust Paul was treated by the Roman courts. Paul had to sit for two years waiting for this. And now a new governor has come in and he cares nothing about Paul's life. He cares nothing about what Paul did or did not do. All he cares about 
It's just keeping the rioting at bay, even if it costs Paul his own life. Now, the big question we need to ask this morning is why does Luke record this for Theophilus? As you go through the Bible, we need to always ask, why does the author write what he writes to the audience he's writing to? And remember, Luke is writing to Theophilus, perhaps a new believer. Why does Theophilus need to see this? I think on the one hand, Theophilus needs to understand that Christianity presents no threat to Rome, but Rome will persecute Christians. It's almost as if Luke is preparing Theophilus. Listen, Theophilus, you're following a crucified Savior. You're living in a world where the Roman justice system was supposed to be the best there could be. But listen, to be a Christian in this world is to expect injustice because you bear the name of Christ. And so Luke records this because as another Christian, Theophilus will follow after Christ. He's preparing him. Do not be surprised when worldly people will rule against you. And I think the other reason why Luke records this is because he's showing how Christ will bring Paul to Rome. Again, this is how Paul will make it there to fulfill all that Christ had told him he'll do. He does it through in just ways of men. And so here's the point this morning. We learn that injustices abound for Christians, and we are to see that. Now, secondly, and these next two points will go a little quicker, but notice, secondly, injustice explained. Again, we see the details repeated over as Agrippa visits with Festus. Look at verse 13. It says, A few days later, King Agrippa and Bernice arrived uh, at Caesarea to pay their respects to Festus. Since they were spending many days there, Festus discussed Paul's case with the king. He said, there is a man here whom Felix left as prisoner. And then as he goes on, he recounts, and notice in a slanted way, uh, the details trying to excuse his injustice. But the first thing we need to ask here is, who is this Agrippa and who is this Bernice? Well, this Agrippa is Agrippa II. Uh, he is from the long line of the Herods that are in the New Testament. Who is this Agrippa? Well, his dad was Agrippa I. He was the one we saw earlier in the book of Acts who arrested Peter and killed James. That was this man's dad. The other claim to fame that he has is that his great-grandfather was Herod the Great. He was the one, of course, who killed all the baby boys in Bethlehem. So he comes from a long line of Herods who ruled by force, and in fact, historians know, of all of the Agrippas and the Herods, he was actually the best, though he was very immoral. The second person is even more shocking, at least I did not know this until this week, that is Bernice. Who is she? Shockingly, Bernice is his sister. Bernice is his sister, and they were at this moment living in a shocking and scandalous incestuous relationship with one another. Uh, she was married to her uncle at one point, and her uncle had died, and then she moved in with her brother, and rumors got around that they were living together, and so she did move out later on, but then back in again. And so here they come to greet Festus, this couple living openly in this very immoral relationship, seeking to rule and to reign, and now enter the discussion of Paul. Now, one of the other things to note about Agrippa, as we will see next week, is that he was very familiar with Christianity. He actually was kind of a half-Jew, and so he knew all about Judaism, but he also knew plenty well about the Apostle Paul and the off-break of Christianity. Now, notice Festus's summary of the details. In verses 15 through 16, notice how he excuses himself all the way. One, he talks about the Jews. They, they brought him uh, the charges against Paul, and they wanted a just condemnation. In other words, he's basically saying, listen, I realize that the Jews were asking for me simply to condemn him, but I, following Roman law, would not do that. And then in verse 18 and 19, notice how he excuses himself by ignorance. Verse 18 says, when his accusers got up to speak, they did not charge him with any of the crimes I had expected. Instead, they had some points of dispute with him about their own religion and about a dead man named Jesus, whom Paul claimed was alive. Then he goes on to say, I was at a loss to judge this. What's the point? Notice that he's saying over and over, there is nothing in Paul that I could do to condemn him. It's simply something to do with religion. Why is that important to know? Because if he was a just judge, Paul should have gone free. But over and over, he's speaking of this in a slanted way, excusing himself until the point 
where he brings in the fact that Paul appealed to Caesar, and that is where they are at. Well, what is the point? From Festus' own mouth, he's acknowledging that he was unjust to Paul. Put as good a slant on it as you can. By the end of the conversation, Agrippa could hear very well that Paul had no reason legally to be in prison. What is the point again? The point that we find here is that even rulers will excuse their injustice in order to put a better spin on it. And as the section there ends, now Festus was quite happy that Agrippa wanted to hear him because you note here that he has no rule or no uh, charges that he can write. Again, why does Luke record this? If I can put it this way, so by the time you get to the end of that section, you're pulling your hair out. This is completely unfair. The judge himself is publicly saying Paul should not be in prison any longer. Now, thirdly and lastly, notice with me injustice exacerbated. Because if this were not enough, notice now these rulers as they flaunt this injustice in Paul's face. Look at verse 23. The next day, Agrippa and Bernice came with great pomp and entered the audience room with high-ranking officers and the leading men of the city at the command of Festus, Paul was brought in. Now, isn't it interesting? Luke says, the next day, what happened? Well, all the rulers dressed in their best robes, and as they entered the room, there were trumpets. They, they put on a big show. They wanted to make much of themselves. Luke wants us to understand that these rulers who are practicing injustice and excusing it are doing so because they want to be made much of themselves. They come with great pomp and circumstances because they like to think they are filled with power and judge overall. But Luke wants us to understand something. It's simply a show. It's simply a man-made show that they're flaunting themselves. All the while, here's lowly Paul being brought in. And notice as the text goes on, Paul is brought into this, this scene of pomp and circumstance to stand before them. Why does Luke record this? Luke is trying to paint a contrast here. Human might and human power is simply a show, but Paul speaks for the King of kings and the Lord of lords. While these worldly rulers practice injustice and flaunt it, Paul will stand before them and he speaks for the king who will judge them one day. And even more remarkable, what Luke is doing is drawing a strong contrast. These people living in pomp think they control all things, but Paul is basically standing before them to say, listen, I serve the king of kings and he is going to use you to bring me to Rome. You live for nothing but a show when you flaunt your injustice. I serve the true king even as I stand here by myself. Now again, look at verse 24 and 25. Notice how Paul once again is declared innocent. Festus said, King Agrippa, and all who are present with us, you see this man, the whole Jewish community has petitioned me about him in Jerusalem and here in Caesarea, shouting that he, had, that he ought not live any longer. I found him that he had done nothing deserving in death, but because he had made his appeal to the emperor, I decided to send him to Rome. Once again, Luke wants us to understand Paul had done nothing wrong. Once again, for the third time in the text, it had been declared by Festus himself there is no legal grounds for condemning Paul. Now here's the the final thing to note. Notice the embarrassment of the scene in verse 26. But I have found nothing definite to write to his majesty about him. Therefore, I have brought him before all of you and especially before you, King Agrippa, so that as a result of this investigation, I may have something to write. For I think it is unreasonable to send on a prisoner without specifying the charges against him. You would almost want to say to Festus, you think? You think this is unreasonable? Absolutely it's unreasonable. Festus, you yourself are claiming that this is nothing more than embarrassment. You are sending the man all the way to Rome, and by your own declaration three times, there's no charges, and so now you've got to coerce Agrippa into helping you find charges in order to make this worth Caesar's time. Here is the point. Luke wants us to understand the scene of this righteous, innocent man, all by himself, surrounded by these worldly rulers who care nothing about justice. And Luke is basically saying to Christians, expect this in your life. Expect injustice. Expect to realize that the worldly people really at the end of the day are willing to compromise for the sake of expediency. And so here's the point this morning. 
We learn that as Christians, we live in this world, and this world is filled with injustice, especially for those who bear the name Christ. And now the greater question needs to be asked, what does this have to do with the gospel? Why this morning do we need to know this in light of the gospel? And I think here's the answer. Because our Savior is the one who faced the greatest injustice ever. Why could Paul confidently and calmly stand in front of this room filled with all of these rulers all by himself? And the answer is because his Savior did it ahead of him. If we could be amazed at the injustice against Paul this morning, we should be even greatly more amazed at the injustice that our Savior faced. This morning, we serve a Savior who stood before the Pontius Pilate and count how many times Pilate declared, I find no guilt in him. How many times did Jesus at that night was he declared sinless and guiltless and yet at the mercy of wicked rulers was he condemned? Now, now here's the great point. Why did he do that? Why did Jesus experience this injustice? It was for you and for me. And even more than that, if we are scandalized by such an injustice as what Paul went through, we need to realize the gospel is the greatest injustice that has ever happened. The gospel is all about one who is innocent, one who is sinless, who on the cross bear all the penalty, all the guilt, all the judgment of guilty, wicked sinners. Did you realize that? That the gospel is all about injustice. That Christ would stand in our place. The reality of this day is the gospel teaches that you and I should stand before Christ on judgment day and we should be condemned and declared guilty for all eternity. But the gospel says that will not be the outcome if you are a believer. Why? Because Christ experienced it on your behalf. The sinless son was cursed on our behalf. The gospel is the greatest injustice mankind has ever witnessed. And this morning, that's the key to experiencing ourselves. When you actually become riveted with that reality, that you and I truly deserve hell, and Christ bore that in our place, what is it to stand before the injustice of this world? You see, that I think is a great point as I contemplated this morning. Really, that is the big point of the sermon this morning. The only way you and I will go throughout this life enduring what we will endure is because we are gripped by what Christ did. Are you gripped by that this morning? You know, I say this numerous times, but we come to church every Sunday, and the danger is we become almost so bored with hearing about the gospel that we're not struck with it, but realize once again this morning what Christ did on your behalf was bear your personal guilt if you are a Christian. And that you are experiencing no condemnation anymore because he lifted it off you. You know, if there's anyone in this life who could cry out, not fair, Jesus alone was the one who could have said it. The cross was the most scandalous injustice that ever took place and is the only way you and I have hope this morning. Now, in conclusion then, what is the application for you and I? Now, let me confess, I struggled with the application. What is the application as we go through this? And I have two things I want to know. One, it teaches us how to suffer as Christians under injustice. Now, I'm just going to admit right out of the, the gate that this is hard for us to comprehend. Is it not true? Because we live in a country where we really haven't faced injustice to this degree. None of us have been imprisoned yet for the name of Christ. None of us have experienced great persecution like many of our brothers and sisters have already experienced. And yet, let me ask you a question. What injustices have you experienced? Yet, though we have not experienced such injustice for the name of Christ, perhaps as grievous as this, as grievous as this we have experienced some. So here's the point this morning. We learn how we suffer as Christians. What Peter wrote in 1 Peter is that we are to be patient in bearing up And even more than that, we are to entrust ourselves ultimately to God as we face these injustices. And again, let's just admit, that's a hard thing to do. When you are facing slander, when you are facing lies, when you're facing maybe even a legal charge that's unjust, is it not the hardest thing to bear patiently? And yet Peter wrote to us to do so. How? By following the example of Christ that he laid for us. Now, one application that I thought of as well in light of this is parents, let us teach our children how to suffer injustice. You know, one of the sayings my dad used to say when I would cry, that's not fair, usually when a sibling likely was wrong, uh, he would say, well, listen, son, life's not fair. Now, there may be some wisdom to that, but maybe we could go a little further with our children. Let's say, you're absolutely right, life's not fair, but you follow a Savior who endured injustice on your behalf. And so let's teach our children from the youngest age, from the gospel, how to face 
and justice in this world. Secondly, it also teaches us God's purpose in injustice. Once again, the point of the text is to show us that Paul faced this and God used it to bring him to Rome. Now, the big picture that I just want to point out is this. Paul did not need to fear injustice because he knew it was part of God's plan. That's one of the great things about being a Christian. When we face injustice to whatever degree, we know there will be one day a final verdict when everyone will stand before Christ. And even with the injustice that we have experienced, whatever that is, we know God can use that for our good. That's the point this morning is God has a purpose for it. And we can learn to rest peaceably, even if we have to defend ourselves through whatever legal means, yet rest peaceably, knowing God has a plan. Amen. Let's pray. Our gracious God and our Heavenly Father, indeed, we stand here this morning amazed at what Christ did on our behalf. Father, we ask now, apply this word to our hearts and our lives. Father, we thank you for your love. We thank you for Christ. And Father, whatever injustice we may face in this life, we ask, O Lord, that our eyes would not be upon that, but that our eyes would be fixed firmly upon Christ. And so, Father, bless us now through your word, we pray. And we ask this in Christ's name alone. Amen. Well, as response.